Welcome to Praxis 413. So before I go any further, I'd like to make clear that what we're engaged in is a critical enterprise of reading white supremacist texts. And let me just start by saying the obvious. The texts we are critically analyzing today are racist, bigoted, anti-Semitic, misogynist, xenophobic, and deeply offensive. The American texts particularly are more crass and unvarnished uh, than the European right texts, which is an issue that I think we'll want to discuss and unpack. Um, but if you look at the American text, uh, which is a compilation uh, intended to uh, represent, quote, the alt-right in the words of its members and leaders, including Richard Spencer and others, and you look at what they consider to be the ideological guideposts, right, there are three of them. The first is that uh, demography is destiny, so because racial or ethnic traits are inherited and most and mostly unchangeable, diversity and multiculturalism do not ultimately enrich white lives, but rather tend to make white societies poor, more dangerous, and finally unlivable for whites. The second ideological guidepost is that Jews not only wield obscene levels of power in Western societies, they use that power to damage native white populations. The third guidepost is that white genocide is underway. Welcome to Critique and, and what? And what? Words matter, language matters, interpretations matter. It shouldn't come as a surprise, as Carl Eckermann observes in his post, that the text we're reading today consists at their core of what they call meta-political dictionaries, right? The uh, Guillaume's Fay, Why We Fight, is mainly a dictionary, right? If from pages 72 to 262, it's what he, it is an alphabetized meta-political dictionary. And the uh, Daniel Freiburg as well contains at its heart a, 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 a dictionary, the meta-political dictionary as well, right? And it shouldn't come as a surprise because words matter. And so even when we say uh, critique and what it is that we're reading, uh, it should matter, as Jason Stanley suggests uh, in his post. Trump's discourse, of course, is, is, is coded in that way, right? Um, uh, when he says she's just a globalist, globalist, we know, know what he's saying, what he's communicating, the anti-Semitism that's hidden behind those words. Um, and so we live at a particular time where the counter forces are being perceived as persecutions, especially among white nationalists that are challenging uh, the way we talk and force us to uh, really question the word, the very words that we use, to borrow perhaps paradoxically in this session from Leo Strauss, who writes, a man of independent thought can utter his views in public and remain unharmed, provided he moves with circumspection. He can even utter them in print without incurring any damage, provided he is capable of writing between the lines. And of course, James Scott draws on this Straussian method to interpret ordinary acts of resistance, and we might need to draw on it as well to rethink uh, what we are dealing with, what we are reading. But Jason urges, urges us not to use the expression uh, the alt-right, um, which is why I haven't yet used it, um, and proposes instead the term fascist. Uh, others, uh, NYU professor Ruth ben Giat talks about fascistic rather than fascist, right, uh, or new authoritarian. Uh, perhaps the words would be white nationalist now, uh, or white supremacist, 
plainly. Uh, of course, uh, in Europe, it was originally the new right. Um, it's not just semantics, right? It's not just semantics. It's a battle that is over, in Daniel Freiberg's word, words, shaping people's thoughts, worldviews, and the very concepts which they use to make sense of and define the world around them. So to help us make sense uh, of these texts and of the world around us, we're really delighted to have four extraordinary critical thinkers here. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and Mick Tausig and I will kind of respond and get the conversation going. Um, in their order of presentations today, uh, let me introduce them quickly to you. Jason Stanley, uh, to my right, uh, joins us from Yale University, where he's the Jacob Urowski Professor of Philosophy at Yale. And um, he um, uh, previously taught at, at Cornell and uh, University of Michigan. And uh, he is uh, an author of uh, several, uh, several books, four previous books, including How Propaganda Works. And then he just published uh, the... Uh, really a bestseller now, uh, How Fascism Works, uh, The Politics of Us and Them, uh, which has already been translated into five languages. Uh, he's also working now in collaboration with David Beaver on uh, a work called Hustle, The Politics of Language, about the non-ideal philosophy of language, which fits perfectly with our discussion today. Uh, after Jason, we'll hear from Renata Selekel, and we're delighted to have Renata back. Uh, joins us from London and Ljubljana, uh, where she's a professor of psychology and law at Birkbeck, uh, University of London, and a senior researcher at the Faculty of Law in Ljubljana in Slovenia. Uh, her writings lie at the intersection of psychoanalysis uh, and law. She's the author of many books, including Tyranny of Choice and On Anxiety. And uh, she's also spearheading a fascinating research project on psychoanalysis and the emotional aspects of, of law and practice uh, as part of its Birkbeck's newly established LLM and critical legal practice. Uh, welcome, Renata. After Renata, we are delighted to have Zeynep Gambetti join us from Istanbul. Uh, all the way from Istanbul. Thank you so much for coming uh, for this. Uh, Zeynep Gambetti is professor of political theory uh, at Bogaziti University in Istanbul, where she's been teaching since 2000. And uh, she studies political philosophy and sociology, political ideas of Hannah Arendt. Uh, she's studied a lot the Kurdish uh, question uh, and political violence. And along with many uh, journal articles and translations, she's the editor of Vulnerability and Resistance, uh, in 2016, of The Kurdish Issue in Turkey, A Spatial Perspective in 2015, and Rhetorics of Insecurity, Belonging and Violence in the Neoliberal Era in 2013. So welcome, uh, Zeynep. And then we'll hear from Carl Ekeman, uh, who joins us from Uppsala University in Sweden, and this year is a visiting scholar at Columbia's Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. Uh, in his research, Call studies the European New Right, and uh, in part, I should say that uh, I, I owe this uh, whole session to Call. Really, um, it was uh, in emails back and forth about about Call's interest in 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 the in the seminar and the praxis that uh, that I realized that it would be important for us to read about the praxis of uh, the European New Right. Uh, and so Carl has been indispensable in, in crafting and putting this together, and I really thank you very much, Carl. Um, his, his doctoral work focuses on the New Right's metapolitical project, and it relates uh, that to the perceptions of vulnerability. Um, and along with this, his research, he participates in Uppsala University's research program, Engaging Vulnerability, and so I also think it's interesting, uh, particularly with Zeynep Gambetti's interest in, in notions of vulnerability and resistance. There's, there's going to be a good conversation here as well. And uh, I also want to tip my hat and thank uh, Mick Tausig for joining me uh, this evening, um, a dear friend and co-author. <coughs> uh, Mick serves as the class of 1933 professor of anthropology at Columbia University. And uh, he, uh, he was a doctor before becoming an anthropologist. And I, I, I never forget that, uh, because I think that it's been uh, always nourished, it's always nourished your extraordinary approach to ethnography and writing. Of course, he's the author of many texts, including most recently, 
Well, most recently it's on palm oil, right? Is that one out now? Palma Africana. It's, it's right out, it's right? Out yeah, and, uh, but before that, The Corn Wolf, 2015, Beauty and the Beast, 2012, what color is the sacred magic of That's the state? Enough, okay, right? enough, enough, enough. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're now on palm oil, though. Okay, all right. So let's um, let's start with Jason, then, and thank you. Uh, so it's an honor to be here. I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna sort of talk. I don't have anything written. Um, uh, the I wanted to start. So I, I my book, How Fascism Works, is an attempt to. Uh, sketch the tactics of fascist political movements and I and I don't and I think you know I don't think Ruth Ben got Ruth Ben Guyatt and I have ruined many a conference back in the day about whether the term fascist was appropriate but we have mutually decided that it kind of is appropriate okay so because she moves to fascistic and I think there's a distinction when I talk about fascist I'm talking about the politics and the tactics the subject today's subject mm -hmm. um, one reason she the reason she didn't talk about fascist was because she thinks she was talking about the structure of the government rather than the tactics and mm -hmm. she's like well as long as it's a multi-party state it's not a fascist state yet but she's talking about the state and the government mm -hmm. and but if we're focusing on the tactics I don't think there's much doubt that the tactics we're seeing are classic tactics that we saw with Mussolini and saw with classic fascist movements like the KKK um, so and on, on the point about it's not just semantics, as a, as a formal semanticist, spent most of my life is formal semantics, the joke in formal semantics conferences is always it's not just semantics. But, um, but the point about language being like vital is like obviously, I mean, it's almost cliche, but it's very clear in the black American philosophy tradition. Baldwin says, the, you know, the white, you know, the black man can never accept the white man's definitions. Um, Here's Baldwin from his New York Times piece, Negroes are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white. Um, the Jew is a white man, and when white men rise up against oppression, they are heroes. When black men rise, they have reverted to their neighbor, native savagery. The uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto was not described as a riot, nor were the participants maligned as hoodlums. The boys and girls in Watts and Harlem are thoroughly aware of this. And uh, in, in, my new, in my new book with David Beaver, like, we look at like the number of times there's a study we take, we actually take it from um, a study of CNN, Fox, and NBC of the descriptions of Baltimore. Uh, Fox describes, so they, uh, Nick Bomaretti looks at uh, the number, the, the, the number of occurrences of riot versus protest in the CNN, Fox, and MSNBC coverage of Baltimore. And, uh, and Fox uses riot seven times out of every 1,000 words in their descriptions of Baltimore. CNN uses, and they use protests around two words per 1,000. Um, MSNBC, CNN uses riot, use riot like 3.6 words out of 1,000, and protests 3.4 words out of 1,000 in the descriptions of Baltimore, 2015. And MSNBC used riot like two words out of 1,000. And... Um, and use, used protest four words out of 1,000 in their description of, uh, of Baltimore. So, the, I mean, the riot, riot versus protest literature is very deep in, in, in uh, critical race theory, obviously. I mean, that's something that you just have to be aware of if you're looking at race in America. And so, uh, so this fo f focus on language is not, yeah, it's not just semantics. It's like the crucial... Um, for someone of my age, it's very hard to say Detroit protest, <laughs> just because of the way I was raised, even though that's what they were. Um, so, um, so I think, yeah, we have to attend to the fact, and and then you look at the literature on national socialism and denazification. What was denazification? Denazification was changing the language, you know, uh, you know, which was an interesting way to, you know, change ideology. So, so what? We have in these doc so so that's the first thing. What we have in these documents is sort of an attempt to to send words into the respectability space, um, and I think it it should worry us reading Guillaume Fay's two thousand one book that so many of these expressions are a core part of the vocabulary of people who call themselves classical liberals nowadays. So uh, you know. Um, uh, my friend John McWhorter, 
we know each other from linguistics days. I mean, and we've debated a couple times. He's cleaned my clock. He's very good. Um, but he has written his 2515 piece on anti-racism, saying it's a new religion. It's a new ideology. Sorry for just mentioning Columbia professors and what follows. But um, so he talks about anti-racism as a new ideology, a new religion, a new ideology. Well, it really overlaps with Guillaume Fay's uh, dictionary entry mm -hmm. of anti-racism and Daniel Fleberg's. A lot of Mark Lilla really is reminiscent of what we're seeing here. The sort of focus on social Darwinism that you see here. The, the, the stuff about um, uh, the, well, so the, well, let's, get, let's get to that later. That's about the ideology rather than, than the language. Um, one thing I want to do that, that, that comes across, I've been to a lot of conferences on, I mean, I want to, uh, on these topic with like ex-white supremacists and stuff like that. And one, th and I, I emphasize this in my text, but the whole goal is respectability, is moving, moving the ideology to respectability. And there's a temptation, especially when you read the American text, to be like, oh, these are extremists. Because in America, you know, you can say everything, but you can't be an anti-Semite. Like, so, like, if you add the anti-Semitism, then you're an extremist. But at this point, like, everything else is okay. So, uh, so, which is useful in fighting back, right? Because then if you can show that, well, this is anti-Semitism, <laughs> then you win. It's reductive um, in, in here, not necessarily in Europe. Um, so, uh, so, I think it's very dangerous to think of this as extremism especially in this moment. Um, because if you do take away anti-Semitism <laughs> from the American texts and you take away some of the more extreme stuff, it is the president of the United States. So, and, you know, there's a standard move, if you're familiar with, with the far right in Europe that has come to power um, or, or what Bannon does here, like what they do is they'll use a term like nationalist, um, which has a history. Fichte, if you look at Fichte's Die Rede an der Deutschen Nation, it's just about, nationalism is about race, it's about language, it's about culture, uh, it's not about economics. And so when you modify nationalism with economics, it's not clear that makes sense. So Bannon, however, Bannon says, oh, it's just economic nationalism. And we have that in the United States with Benjamin Rush. So, uh, who, who, so, uh, so what you do, if you use nationalism and you don't modify it, you send it out as a signal and then people can like add and modify themselves. So I think it's dangerous to think of this as them when, when, you know, it's much more, and there's an interplay. This is something that people always emphasize. The, the people in, dressed up on the streets, they have an interplay with the respectable people. Because the respectable people are like, those are not us. You know, we're not, we're not fascists. Because look at them. Look at how they dress. They, they're untethered from reality. They're crazy. But us, we're, we're wearing suits. So if you think of it as them, then it's going to, if you think of it as them, then that feeds into the idea that, uh, that, it's not us. <laughs> it's not happening in the respectable spaces. And right now, what we have all over, uh, all over the world now is we have, uh, we have movements, we have the fascist ideology moving into respectability and then using the sort of extremists as a sort of cleansing mechanism to say, see, we're not that. Look at them in Charlottesville. That's not us. Those are losers. And then that what then they can use all the same vocabulary, and a lot of the and and the same ideology, and uh, and and move into and and make it respectable. So like you know Jordan Peterson talk. I mean compare Jordan Peterson to Guillaume Fay. Cultural Marxism, the hysteria about the universities. Um, so when you just and then you deny that as part of that you're talking about Jews, even though. As Sam Moyne recently showed, <laughs> the, the history of cultural Marxism is connected um, to anti-Semitism. And I'll just end by, um, 
by noting, this is just sort of a random point, but like one thing in the coverage of Pittsburgh that was annoying, I mean, I think you see this clearly in the text, like for white supremacists, um, or white supremacists, in fascist ideology, in KKK ideology, in Nazi ideology, Jews are not white. <laughs> so, you know, it was a racial, uh, Pittsburgh was a racial event, not a religious event. You know, Jews are, are, their goal is to destroy the white race, and you see this here. So, so I think that's also tactically important, because it's tactically important for Jewish Americans to realize that they're not regarded as white. And, and I'll end there. All right, thanks. Jason, um, thank you. Right. And, and, and the only thing I would add is it's, in, is, it's, it's the silences also that are tactical. Yeah, the nationalism, times, right? and then you're silent about right. what the modifier right. is. Right, or, or just, I mean, as you were talking about, you know, we're not, ex okay, the, you, the use of the them uh, as a way to distinguish yourself, but it's a, as a cleansing mechanism, right? But also, as we've seen, the use of, of silence yeah. about, right? So it's silence about the violence, the violence at, at Charlottesville or something Trump, like that. Trump right? said the worst mistake he made was apologizing for his comments about Charlottesville. So mm -hmm. he said, I should never have done that. Mm -hmm. um, so that... Uh, right. right. But it's, 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 so it's, I mean, it's, and obviously this is part of semantics, but it's, it's the words, of course, but then it's the timing of a particular intervention of a word, the silence, the, the moments of silence, whether to address or not, right? Yeah, I mean, no, so no, yeah it's not, no, this is, right? not saying right. something very often is a good way of communicating something. Right, right, right. yeah. Not yeah. saying something yeah. when you yeah. should say something. Right. Right. Yeah. is a way of yeah. implicating, yeah. to use the yeah. formal terminology. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay, Renata. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I decided to read this text um, from kind of an affective perspective. What kind of emotions they stir um, in us, the readers, but also in the men to whom they are addressed. You know, I read them, in a way, as a manifesto to the white man, and in some way, if we speak about fascism, it's, uh, I think, uh, useful to remember Primoz Levi saying that every era has its own fascism. So my question became, what does today's time of neoliberalism add, and why does today's time actually become such a fruitful ground for this kind of discourse? I think that one of the successes of neoliberalism has been a certain internalization of the ideology, you know, on the one hand, sort of like the, the whole ideology of choice, everyone can make it, you know, regardless mm -hmm. of their economic background. And the internalization, in, in some way, um, strengthened the feelings of anxiety uh, and actually the feeling of guilt for not making it, and at the same time, the feeling of inadequacy. So this is like, I think, uh, where we find a really fruitful ground, that this, today's subject has truly sort of in some way internalized this ideology, although maybe in their rational minds they don't uh, believe in it, you know, but it's even a situation where you, even if you don't believe in it, in a way, you would not oppose it. So it, the, uh, my idea is that mm. ex this oh, extreme God. right is actually, you know, playing very well on, on this, you know. And on, on top of this, we have in our ideology uh, the idea of you are not in some way allowed to be ignored, and you have to find a way to be heard. Uh, all this, in a way we can say, comes from the ego psychology, and it's another very fruitful ground, although we have, you know, very powerful ignorance today at work in regards to what is knowledge, you know. So, but, you know, I, I read also ignorance as this idea of being ignored and not being ignored. So, this is another point which they are targeting, I think, very well. Now, of course, we had ages of anxiety before and after World War I, World War II. Even if you look at the discourse of how anxiety was perceived after World War I, you would see very similar idea of the end of the idea of Europe. Even Paul Valéry writes about, you know, after World War I, the idea of Europe died, uh, death of Europe, the, the death of the idea of future or belief uh, in future. And I think that in some way, 
uh, this anxiety at that time, as we know, has been easily channeled to the fascist ideology. And today, there is a similar danger, but again, different ground. Where I think we need to sort of look at is what kind of grounds the new technology actually present to this new uh, art right. So with this pressure, you have to be heard, you know, express yourself and so on, on the feel and the feeling of guilt and anxiety and self-blame that uh, people feel internalizing the ideology of neoliberalism. We have now new social media where we can easily find a space where we can shout, when we can be heard. And at the same time, you know, our messages are amplified, reinforced. So the feeling of anxiety, which, you know, is a very normal feeling, but it can get, you know, out of joint, especially under the pressure of, of media or other ideas of uh, propaganda, you know, here too starts playing another word. It is in some way it can easily be reinforced, but also it can find, you know, a very anxious person can find various points of identification. Now, when we are anxious, sometimes identifying you know, with someone who appears to know or to give you a theory or appears to even show compassion with your feelings can be at least temporary alleviating. So I think that in a way, art right successfully in a way uses this setting. But what I was surprised in this discourse was also how, you know, though it speaks from the idea of compassion, understanding the pain of white men and so on, how cruel this discourse actually is uh, in the way of really speaking so badly about this white man, you know. They're couch potatoes. They're watching this pointless uh, football, you know. The, the blacks playing uh, tattooed black criminals and, you know, they're beer-loving, uh, um, effeminate, and so on. And, you know, the, the whole idea, of course, is that this white, lazy man have to be woken up, fired up. And here, unfortunately, I think that they are succeeding. Now, they are, in some way, with some, of course, creating sort of points <coughs> of identification, with some with a lot of mental health problems, you know, it might be very well that, you know, they are finding the fruitful ground also that these people engage with violence, which is why precisely in the last, you know, a uh, few months and also before we have seen uh, so many people taking these words literary. Now, I don't think that, you know, uh, that, uh, for example, uh, p the person uh, who was sending uh, these letter, letter bombs uh, uh, was identifying in a way with Trump discourse in such a way that he felt that Trump was sort of saying to him directly to do this. But it is quite possible that he was able, in a way, to find a kind of a space in the on the you know white supremacy internet sites which we frequented where we in a, he in a way in a way socialized his anger and got you know his anger reinforced so with some people yes who might have psychotic structure it is possible that they perceive that they are hearing a voice directly telling them to do something while you know others can truly become violent because of you know this kind of a let's say fruitful ground that they find uh, on the internet. So I would, in a way, sort of kind of uh, question, you know, in some way, how this discourse is sort of using emotions. And, you know, in some way, I would also kind of question what kind of identifications, points of identification it is opening up. Um, you know, from Freud, we know that quite often for identification, it's quite important to have like identification with an Einziger Zug, a sort of kind of a unary thread. And, you know, Lacan was speaking about that too. And I was starting thinking that in some way, the whole idea of lying became a certain kind of a paradoxical, I think, un unifying point. Now, when you look at the discourse, for example, the discourse which is speaking about the danger of, um, of caravan, I doubt that you know, the writers, alt-right writers who are speaking about this danger, danger thoroughly believe that you know, a couple of thousand people can endanger such an you know, enormous country. 
so we can even say that you know when they are writing about this danger and using the images, they are in some way consciously <laughs> lying, but they are using this point of lying very successfully, precisely to steer certain emotion. Now, for us on the left, trying to fight this discourse, there's still you know another problem in how to go about you know on the one hand emotions, but on the other hand even the whole kind of a new sort of fight for words, for the vocabulary that is emerging. In some way, I would say that the alt-right has kind of uh, uh, showed a certain kind of, a, let's say, I would say even a respect on top of Gramsci, which is you know, an author who they are you know, using for their own purposes constantly, also for deconstruction. You know, in some way, I would not be surprised if some at some point they will start uh, quoting, uh, mm -hmm. as they are quoting Gramsci, deconstruction. You know, because in a way they are using the deconstruction discourse. You know, the question of what is a fact, what is the truth, and so paradoxically, left has been now pushed mm -hmm. in sort of fighting for truth and facts, and relativism <clears throat> is becoming a prohibited word. So you know how to <laughs> deal in discourse when when you are cornered into you know sort of uh, something and you know actually where you know someone else has reinterpreted mm -hmm. a certain kind of a, let's say vocabulary I would say quite successfully I think that's kind of the question for our practice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And. Um, yeah, and I think, we, and we, and and definitely, we'll come back to this question of the the Gramsci. Uh, that, that's fine. You hold on to it. Of of, of the Gramscian way in which, um, uh, or the way in which they're kind of appropriating Gramscian thought, um, particularly with Carl's intervention. Thank you. Uh, yes, Zeynep. Yeah. Um, thank you. I think I might be the odd one out here, but um, I, I mean what. I want to say might sound provocative, but it's not intended to be provocative. I am really going through the questioning um, myself. So I hear Jason's like call not to to um, use they as the pronoun to sort of you know distance themselves them them again. I mean, how how are you going to speak right? Um, the alt right or the fascist? I prefer the term fascist as well. So I hear um, how um, we should not be constructing sort of like a, a, a coherent group and also uh, sort of setting ourselves um, at a distance from what is happening. I want to move a, a bit back and try to um, establish the continuities between what I call neoliberal um, discourses and practices, and the actual uh, fascistic, you know, discourses today. So it's not all about some zombies emerging out of the blue, but the ground um, that enabled um, such moves towards uh, social Darwinism, even, has been reinvented and legitimized by certain practices to which liberals. Um, uh, you know, gave their support or were a part of the, the actors that actually um, sort of implemented these policies. Obama, not, um, not um, of course, is not an exception, Merkel, uh, etc. So um, what I want to do is sort of um, go beyond the analogy. Um, yes, there are lots of analogies to, to sort of draw between um, outright or fascist discourses today and say you know, Mussolini's text on doctrine of fascism <coughs> or Hitler's text. Um, but what I think is, uh, is necessary is to go beyond the ideology, go beyond the language. <laughs> so as I, I might be an odd one out here. Um, we must look at the practices that are envisaged by the discourses and the logic underlying these. Um, and ask what, us, ourselves whether there is really a break um, between the discourses of the, the alt-right or the fascists and discourses that came right before them uh, and that opened the, the terrain. 
So is, 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 uh, I'm going to say alt-right just for practical purposes, May. Um, is the alt-right really constituting a break um, with contemporary practices? Um, and I think this is the idea of break is suspicious is in one other respect, and that is it serves to exonerate us, liberals or progressives, right? Um, it, it provides us with a comfortable position of externality from which to critique, you know, alt-right ideology without asking the question of whether we too might be involved in reproducing, you know, some of these practices and discourses. So what I propose... Um, is that and reading reading out like text was a very um, worthwhile exercise. So I thank Bernard for making me do this. I wouldn't have read them um, without him. Um, I really realized how much the outright owes to the left. Uh, and this was this was that realization that was at the time very shocking. At the same time, shocking. But I think there is. <clears throat> A specific form of repolitization, repolitization um, that the alt right is involved in doing in an age of neoliberal depolitization. Uh, so they are bl bringing politics back into the picture. It's not just the economy, stupid, right? Um, and they are radicalizing some of um, the malpractices that liberals help constitute and normalize. Um, and so, um, basically, um, what I take to be neoliberal um, practices um, are part of what Foucault might call um, biopolitics as well. So I have this long description that I'm not going into right now on the blog of what I think neoliberalism is. I, I side with, you know, Foucault's reading um, of um, biopolitics in his lectures before the birth of, of biopolitics, where he relates biopolitics with security, a certain technique of security. Um, and also in the previous lectures, again, um, society must be defended, where he's relating them to fascism, actually, the the you know the practice of letting die, um, and also the 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 practice of sort of um, justifying the letting die through the idea of general well-being of a designated uh, strata of the population. So um, so therefore, um, I think neoliberal governmental methods. Um, uh, based on, for instance, indirect interventions at the level of populations, co which consisted of using privatization, financialization, deregulation, differential performance criteria to induce modifications in aggregate behavior, were uh, the precursors uh, to um, sort of the the... Uh, the hollowing out of the, you know, the concept of the universal rights. Um, and liberals, the liberal establishments, turned a blind eye to the fact that certain portions of the population must be disposable um, for the well-functioning of neoliberal governmentality. Why? Because everybody should be put at risk. Right. I mean, that is how. I mean, Wendy Brown discusses this wonderfully in her um, the, the Undoing the Demos book. Um, why? Um, because it would have been impossible to produce the aggregate desire to conform and adjust um, if, without removing constitutional guarantees against reducing individuals to like manageable matter. Right. Uh, or effective access to welfare, public goods, um, uh, uh, access to jobs. If you don't remove these, then risk cannot become productive. But neoliberalism is all about uh, making risk productive. Um, if each and every citizen is faced with risk, 
then and only then do we construct ourselves into human capital, right? So without removing those guarantees, um, it wouldn't have worked. Um, we wouldn't have considered ourselves as commodities with a market p price and a marginal utility um, had there not been um, the, the dismantling of what was the liberal state. Um, and I think somebody like Friberg actually sees this, right? I mean, he is, it's not all about um, immigration that he's against. He's against, you know, what he calls plastic and fluid consumer identities. Uh, that's why the white, you know, men are uh, couch potatoes, yeah. right? They're like in consumer culture. They've been consumed by um, market liberalism. And so, but what does he propose in their place? An ethnic-based identitarianism, right? So, but if we remain at the level of ideology, we wouldn't notice that there are some continuities between the neoliberal biopolitics of fluidity and the cures that the alt-right is proposing. Um, the alt-right does not advocate a return to the intrinsic value of each and every life, but wants to authoritatively pre-arrange the risks, pre-arrange disposability. So <laughs> it's going to designate an in-group, right, that is, supposed to, that is um, going to be protected from risk, and an out-group, that would need to be disposed of so as to reduce the precarity of the in-group. Um, and, and please note that the in-group and the out-group are biopolitically defined. It's a matter of demographics. Um, lifestyle choices, etc. cetera. Um, so what it wants to do is to secure the curves that derive normality from the demographics of the majority and to dispossess um, you know, targeted populations instead of leaving things to chance or to the market. But I'm saying that it nevertheless politicizes the distribution of levels of precarity and therefore it says the selection should be made by human willpower instead of the impersonal forces of the market. So it's politicizing what neoliberalism was doing in a deep political way, saying, oh, it's the market that does it. Oh, there's lots of homeless in San Francisco. Well, it's because of Silicon Valley, not because of the human will. Right? So it's politicizing. And I think this, the question of identity is also a case in point in which, you know, they, they're hijacking the right of di to difference, which is actually mm. recognized in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the right to difference. Um, but let's remember that the, the neoliberal so slogan was the equal right to inequality. Um, and it was justified because freedom, under the neoliberal, you know, um, sense, a regime, um, is what? Freedom is freedom of to move, grow, invest, develop livelihoods, and take care of ourselves without any protection or intervention from the government. But as Wendy Brown has, has so wonderfully shown, and many others, you know, I'm thinking of Mauricio Lazarato's work on debt, that this type of freedom can, is not possible without <clears throat> the multiplication of societal and economic risks. Uh, and, and this, um, 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 what, what I mean, I'm just like trying to cut short, uh, because Barnard said we should talk for 15 minutes. Um, th what this is doing is basically that if we are, we fail to become self-investing, if we fail to fit ourselves into the flexible um, sort of, you know, exigencies of the neoliberal market, if we fail to turn ourselves into human capital, this includes academia. And let's not look far away. The neoliberal market is not there. It's just here. 
if we don't, you know, if we refuse to abide by the performance criteria. SSCI, indexed, publish or perish, I mean, it's something that's happening. If we do not do these, then we are not supposed to be rights-bearing citizens. We have no right to a job, we have no right to housing, we have no right to social security. But then that means rights were already conditional and not universal anymore, right? I mean, the fact that academia, we ourselves are reproducing these practices shows that we might practically not be liberals anymore in the ideal sense of sustaining universal rights, okay? Um, and so I think there is a different um, sort of um, politicization that it, the new right or uh, alt right is doing uh, because we, I mean, I consider myself of the left, that we have stopped doing, right? The alt right is replacing the left um, in decrying this impersonal power towards conformity. Um, but what it's doing is that instead of, instead of again, um, sort of promoting a more egalitarian um, type of politics, it is reconstructing difference, reconstructing difference um, as a difference in identity, so a difference of identities, it is Repoliticizing um, sort of the, the the informal laws of the market, um, saying no, we will not submit equally to the market, and then operating the 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 axis or the 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 separation between rights bearing citizens and those citizens that are deemed leeches, losers, the unfit on an identitarian basis. Okay, so it's using the same, like, you know. And anyway, um, just one last um, point I want to make. I mean, the longer um, essay is on the blog, like I said, um, is that I don't think there are any liberal institutions or a liberal order left anymore that the outright may be challenging. That is passé. And it has already, the liberal order has already been hollowed out um, by neoliberalism, neoconservatism, and what have you. So I think praxis-wise, what we should be doing is to avoid being cornered, as you were saying, being cornered um, and then turning um, defensive what we should be doing is, yes, they're right, the left has already always had the upper hand in the creation of culture, the culture not of the cultural in industry, of course, but we should again take the initiative to repoliticize these conditions, inequalities uh, that are being um, imposed on societies across the globe. I come from Turkey, it's happening there as well. So this is not an American um, situation we're observing. Bolsonaro, um, Orban, Putin, Erdogan, um, Le Pen, Trump, etc. across the board are forming a new international of the right. But all these societies are now under a neoliberal economic, societal, and political regime. <clears throat> and therefore, the same type of mm, branding, uh, uh, using terrorism or l the term leechers for those who are opposing the system, dissenting, de uh, demanding rights, uh, is also taking place in Turkey, for instance. So what we should do, we should actually turn our attention and join our hands in devising conventions and cultures, again, 
that are not merely directed at conserving our actual positions, because those actual positions are complicit in what's happening. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Zena. Um, and uh, I think uh, I think we're I, I do think we're going to want to spend some time. Uh, we'll, we'll hear Carl first, but I do think we want to spend some time going back to these questions of uh, of the relationship to the market yeah. and. Um, and the way in which there is this uh, thread of anti-consumerism, so that that is uh, in the in these writings, uh, that has this uh, real feel of kind of anti-neoliberalism, um, but also this this there's this conf seeming confusion about the role of the market or, or the way in which it then gets limited to. Like European whites only, but um, okay. So we'll come straight back to that um, after we hear from Carl. All right. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here, and thank you for three brilliant presentations so far. It's it's highly inspiring, and, and I agree with very much of what you're saying, <clears throat> and especially to think of. Um, and by the way, when when people from other countries come to Sweden and discuss Swedish nationalism. There's a tendency sometimes to get pissed when you don't understand the common affections in the room. I find myself in a similar position uh, now, so it's not my intention to be provocative if I say something that is out of the sphere of affectivity that we're in. But I think that there, there is a possibility here to see something uh, productive in what is happening and what people are feeling and demanding and desiring within the alt-right. And this is one of those things. I mean, the demand for another kind of identity, which a demand which hasn't need, doesn't need to be satisfied by a national or ethnic identity, but some kind of commonality with people. And that is both a political question and an existential question, I think. And that's one of the things that I wanted to bring up in the text before. So to think of both these things, I think, might be interesting for today. Uh, right now, I, I hadn't planned on, on elaborating on the blog post, actually. In the blog post, I tried to sketch a trajectory for how the discussion of metapolitics has, has looked internally within the right, within the radical right from Europe. I didn't discuss uh, the alt-right's history to any extent whatsoever with their American traditions, mostly because I'm not that familiar with them. Uh, but right now, I would uh, rather like to pick up where I left off, if that's okay with everybody, and if, if there are questions to the post, we can get back to them. Uh, because I'd like to put some questions on the table with regards to the metapolitics of the contemporary alt-right, and especially what they've called, in passing, the question of the flashpoint. I mean, th that is the question, when does someone enter into the discourse of the alt-right? How do they get people in there? And I'm going to be quite practical and, and quite hands down. So. Um, and it's, it's not an intention to do a critical reading, but I'd like to approach the question of how does one engage with these texts, as texts, like here, they're present, they're on my table, I read them, how do they work, in a way. And when reading the text from previous seminars, we might well imagine that any critique we can put forward uh, would be accepted by the authors, or by people who think as the authors does. So when we critique the Invisible Committee, for example, by neglecting perspectives from people who are white men in the middle class, we can imagine that they would say, oh, well, you're right, we should have thought about that. Um, so we might imagine that the presuppositions underlying our critique are agreed upon from the start. When it comes to the readings for this seminar, I deem it unlikely that someone who has previously participated in this seminar series would read the text in such a way. But the problem is that that doesn't amount to saying that nobody does. There are people who read these texts and think that, no, this is some good stuff. So let's assume now, just as an experiment, that we want to read these texts critically with the intention of saying something to the people otherwise adhere to these ideas. Or let's go even further. Let's say that we're going to propose critique to the authors. Okay? The problem then is the question on what, uh, regarding what we should build such a critique on. All right? And that problem is, is uh, underlined by the fact that one of the alt-right stratagems has been to continuously disavow all the presuppositions underlying criticism. 
And I'm going to set aside for the moment whether or not the question of the criticism as they detail it here is the actual criticism that they've gotten, but that is their their strategy. And hence the fascination for Bane, you know, the villain from the <laughs> third Christopher Nolan movie, if you've seen it. Uh, Bane, like the alt-right, disavows the presuppositions of modern civilizations, its moral expectations and political motivations. Most often this boils down to the fact that they claim that they don't give a damn if anybody calls them white supremacists. And they see that as their strength. Now this doesn't mean that it would be difficult to disavow these texts, or to criticize them, or even to just laugh them off, because it's sometimes it's even funny, it's almost ridiculous. Uh, but that would be from the position that we find ourselves in. And that poses the question whether or not these authors or the people who think like this are lost to us. And if they are lost, to whom should we propose a critique, or a disavowal, or a laugh? Mm. And why would we do that? So who are we talking to on a very practical level? Now, assuming that we still have a reason to engage, well, let's say with the author, which is perhaps an untimely idea, given that he was declared dead some 50 years ago, uh, but let's also assume that we cannot assume standards that are exterior to these texts. Okay. So for the sake of the experiment, we proceed with a kind of imminent criticism. We try to find out what is the, uh, the standpoint that the text takes to begin with, and how can we use that to critique it. And actually, I think that, that uh, our other speakers have done that a lot, way a lot better than I will be doing at the moment. So. But this is, this is to prove a point. And I'm going to take anti-white newspeak by George T. Shaw here as an example. Uh, Shaw returns several times to the standard of logical coherence. You know, he says that we just want to make liberals, or what he says, shit libs, to speak the data and the logic. Okay? And he, he returns to the standards of what is clearly true and easily verifiable. That, that's what he claims. And I'm going to set aside the question whether or not what he claims is clearly true and easily verifiable really is so. Uh, but let's assume that we approach the text with the assumption of just hearing it out in its own terms and take logical consistency as that standard, you know, the criterion that we want here. Uh, Shaw then seems to be claiming two things. First, with regards to what a newspeak term is. So, first, that a newspeak term is a vessel for delivering absurdities past our logical defenses. This should mean, or it seems at least, that he regards communication as an exchange. You know, we give each other object that contains meanings, which is a, uh, I think Jason can speak about this afterwards, it's a rather outdated view of language, I would say, but it's a metaphor of language. And he takes racism as an example, and claims that racism is really a concept that contains a two-part proposition. All right? And I'm going to set aside for the moment whether or not anybody has ever claimed what he claims this two-part proposition contains. So... So what it seems to be implying is that a new speak term contains an entomy, that is a syllogism with an excluded premise. And should we try to structure that through two means structure for how we analyze arguments, what he's saying is that it contains the data and the warrant of an argument. And this is on page 189. On page 191 he's going to shift that a bit and claim that it's not really containing the data and the warrant, but the data and the claim in the argument. And you don't have to care about what that means, it's just a minor inconsistency. But that minor inconsistency is minor in relation to his second claim, which he poses on the same page where he began, on page 188. There he seems to be claiming that racism is a word that doesn't contain anything at all, that it is a mere signal, a thing experienced as evil, and a trigger of instantaneous moral dread. Okay, I'm going to set aside the question whether or not we should speak of anger instead of dread. But. So the point here is that in this hypothetical experimental critique I've been putting forward, uh, I've been trying to follow the consistency that Scholz called for, and I find myself with two conflicting ideas. You know, one in which the word is a vessel, and another in which the word is a signal. So he's saying the word does not contain a proposition, and the proposition that the word contains is a lie. Now this is catalogic. When, when Freud uses the story of the kettle, he, he tells the story of a man who borrows a kettle uh, and then returns it broken. And the man who borrowed it from uh, sues him, and to his defense he says three things. He says that, first of all, I never borrowed your damn kettle. Second of all, it was already broken when I did. <laughs> and third of all, when I returned it to you, it was in perfect condition. <laughs> Now, for Freud, this logic is simultaneously the stuff of jokes, or the comic, 
and one of the modes of thought of the unconscious is manifested in dreams, where we find no such thing, I'm quoting here, as an either-or, only a simultaneous juxtaposition. I am not saying that I have in any way performed a psychoanalytic reading of this text, uh, that would be presumptuous, but the pairing of the dream and the joke are rather apt as concepts when discussing these texts and as discussing two different parts of the metapolitical struggle. So are you with me so far we would come? This was an experimental reading, just asking what's happening in the text. And what's happening is, in choosing not to laughing, laughing this text off or to disavow it, uh, it seems that, okay, we have ended up with a contradiction. Maybe we could tell Shaw that, hey, Shaw, this doesn't really work out. Don't you see that you're contradicting yourself? Perhaps that would be worth something, right? Or perhaps it turns out that I'm wrong and he's not really contradicting himself. It might be able to work it out. But that doesn't really matter for the text, and I think this is the crucial thing. Because all the while in reading this text, I have been setting aside different things which are rather important. Whether or not the typical critique of the alt-right really looks like this, for example. Or whether or not anyone has ever claimed this or that about people who see differences or whether or not it is clearly true and easily verifiable that a child molester must be destroyed. And even those things pale in comparison to the other kinds of ideas that I've been immersed with when reading, about white genocide, about Jewish group agendas, which he speaks of in parasitic terms as damaging to host societies. Huh? And I think this is one of the things that is worth inquiring, and the immersion as such rather than the propositions found in the text. And I think it's probably the best approach to, to the art right idea, not of what they're actually thinking, but to their idea of political practice. So I'm not saying that this means that we should study it as we study a dream, but think of it in terms of political practice. It is not necessarily what is being said that is important, it is the immersion into a sphere where one is surrounded by these ideas, which are too many to counter when you read. It's called argumentum ad nauseam, when there's simply too much, you become nauseous. It's not only a question of repetition, but of sheer number. Okay? A flood of notions whose resonance is not necessarily threatened by any simultaneous juxtaposition, hence the likening to a dream. So if one approaches the book from this perspective and asks what it says about itself, I think this is more to the point, so that it tries not to convince the reader, but to bring the reader into its own perspective into its own interpretation of the world. And if we take Richard Spencer's essay as an example, I mean, this book is marketed as a book which once and for all should show the alt-right perspective. That's what they say. It's the words of their members and leaders. On the back cover it says, you've heard from their detractors. Here is an opportunity to get the information firsthand and judge for yourself. Okay. So it's, it's, it's the shit. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is the stuff. Now, Spencer could have elaborated on the principles that he published in his Charlottesville statements about what the alt-right stands for. The initial call for papers for this book contained a section in the book called Political Science, where they were supposed to discuss political science from the point of view of alt-right. I don't see much of that in this book, in the end result. So I think it's on to something else. And what is Spencer doing? He's writing about football. All right, you have the chance to present the alt right and you write about football. And I don't say this to heckle him, but getting people engaged, getting men to do something manly together, find an identity or so on, I think that's important to them. But I think that the craft of Spencer's essay lies in the kind of perspective of the world one can assume through reading it. In fact, he has managed to summarize their structures of arguments, their critical insights, if you want to call it that, and packaged it in familiar forms where the coach becomes a perfect metonymy for the conservative politician, dressing as a conservative, pretending to be both father and general, while embracing progressive ideals for the sake of his egotistical interests, and even sacrifices his own team for the sake of his own career. So I think the craft of the essay lies in providing that argumentative structure for critical interpretation of the world and events, an unveiling, so to speak, of the material interests underlying notions such as multiculturalism and feminism and so on, according to the old right, or according to Spencer. In this way, this structure of interpretation then can be transposed to other fields, for example, when Trump is going on about George Soros, or when the old right support, supporters yelled at the values of the left, or the values of Pepsi, or when Spencer claims that the left isn't speaking truth to power, they are power speaking. So, but it's, it's through this image.
And by the way, this is why I think that Spencer's metapolitics is more Nietzschean than Gramscian. So, what has been my point in performing a rather sloppy and unsatisfactory reading of the text? Um, I believe that we have more to gain in reading this book as an instantiation of pol metapolitics and less of a representation of what they think. And thinking of the pair of the dream and the joke might be helpful here. And this relates to what Jason was saying a little while ago about the, the goal of sending into the realm of acceptability certain ideas. And I completely agree, but I also want to claim that that's not the whole picture. How am I with the time, by the way? Can I, can I go on a little while? Two okay. minutes. All right, I'm going to try and make this quick then. Uh, reading the book in such a way as a dream world enables us to act ask what activities are involved in getting people to enter this dream. Okay? And if we look at what Friedberg is saying with regards to the question of the moment when a person of the masses softens to their ideas, he says that it's usually the moderate right-winger on page 180 in this book, uh, or libertarian who regularly sees alt-right memes on social media and at a certain point finds himself chuckling or nodding in agreement. Okay, so my question is, what is this chuckle? And the most prominent theory today is the incongruity theory about laughter. That is, we laugh or we find amusement in things that just doesn't add up, inconsistency, incongruity, uh, contradictions. So, and that's Freud's catalogic. And that rings well when we look through at the text what they're on about, because they are nearly obsessed with contradictions. Both Shaw's counter-revolutionary lexicon and the Newspeak Terminalist are concerned with that fringe, like right on the outside of the dream, that flashpoint, the moment at which citizens internalize absurdities. Okay. Now what this means, and why I'm talking about this, to, to end off with a question, can we conceive of this metapolitical struggle as consisting in two projects, in fact? One of the dream, where the prevalence of ideas and changes in the meaning of words are at the fore, as well as the pushing of certain perspectives into the realm of acceptability, for example. But also one on the outside, when Friedberg mentions guerrilla warfare where there is not so much a matter of introducing ideas, but pitting the ideas that are already there against each other. This would be the destructive aspect. This question leaves us uh, with a reason to get back to, I hope, um, is whether or not these are two different workings on language, not only pushing ideas as the way we usually think of it, uh, which is a question of paradigm, you know, the meaning of words. But the latter here is not as much uh, par paradigmatic as it is syntagmatic not so much a question of vocabulary as it is a question of grammar, the relation between the words and ideas which are not their own. And I believe that that is quite important, not only what they do with their own ideas, but what are they doing in constellating the ideas that are already acceptable in discourse in order to further that project. Uh, and perhaps we can get back to that as well. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I thought uh, it might be helpful to to actually dive in and 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 uh, dive into some of the actual text and some of the words and some of the passages that we've we've uh, we raised here. Um, uh, I, I I wanted to start with the passages on on the market. Um, I then uh, Stanley uh, Jason. The first uh, <laughs> Uh, was going to intervene uh, on the on the Shaw on the Shaw text. Anyone else who wants to kind of jump in on particular passages as well, um, uh, and tell me if you want to jump in as well. Um, but uh, but so the passage that um, in the in the Daniel Freiberg text that really picks up on these questions that Zeynep was raising about neoliberalism and the relationship to. Uh, uh, economics uh, are the, the there's one there's a, there's this well there's a recurring uh, textual reference to consumerism right and transforming the having transformed us into uh, um, uh, consumers developed by the oligarchs of the new global marketplace of liberalism right so all of those I mean so those notions of kind of a, of a critique of uh, the uh, entrepreneurial, uh, consumerist, uh, neoliberal, here liberal, but global marketplace uh, are indeed all there and share 
so share with uh, a lot of the uh, left critiques uh, of neoliberalism. When you get to page 30 and 31, uh, and this is in The Real Right Returns, Daniel Freiberg, pages 30 and 31, then you get a real, uh, a real deeper dive into uh, the place of economics. Um, and it's interesting, and of course, there, a lot of it is coded, right? Um, uh, the capacity of free markets, free people, and free trade to con create economic wealth, this is on the bottom of 30, right, should not be underestimated and should not be limited for other reasons than curbing the influence of money in politics right, or dealing with social problems with which the market alone is unable to cope. And right before that, uh, he writes, primacy does not equal regulation or planning. Okay, so. Right there, you're getting the the you're getting the planning. You're getting Hayek, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and you have there a um, an embrace of market mechanisms, right? Uh, but then uh, on the next page, on page thirty one, uh, he then quotes Alain de Benoit's words, and so the founder of the New Right in France, uh, and he writes, you know, we'll gladly welcome a society with a market, but not a market society, right? Okay, so obviously it's playing both sides of the, he's trying to play both sides. There is an idea there of welcoming a society with a market, but not a market society, of the critique of, uh, that he's, he's almost embracing, and maybe this was, maybe, you know, this comes from Benoit, a, the, um, actually it's the, it's the Foucauldian critique of neoliberalism as being the truth is based on the market, right, the, the, the truth, truth works as a function of market, uh, of its reference to the markets. Um, but he does then code pretty clearly on page 31 that, um, that what he's interested in here is that the benefits, some social services, uh, health care, and social security, should be limited to Europeans right. and not extended to non-Europeans whose only interest in being in Europe is to selfishly take advantage of these resources which are freely handed out yeah, to them that's, that's, by utopian politicians and I, social I, crusaders. I think you're overreading. Right? Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm... I, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Well, go because, ahead. Zay, I mean, I, Zainab is absolutely right that there's ultimately a social Darwinism that shares with neoliberalism, and the people, the, the people, the Europeans are hardworking, and everyone else is lazy. Mm -hmm. And they don't have value because they're lazy and they're not successful on the market. They, you know, so they just steal things. Mm -hmm. This is why the gates of Auschwitz say Arbeit macht frei, because you've got to force the outgroup to work for free to teach them about hard work. And that's what Zainab was saying, was like neoliberalism has this thing where value only comes with hard work. And that's utterly central to fascism. Mm -hmm. And so what you just read, the end, is the important part. We don't give them to non-Europeans, because non-Europeans are lazy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, or, or, or Southern Europeans. Like, or Southern Europeans, right. I mean, I'm not going to parse Europeans. Europeans. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but, 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 I take it, but I take it it's not, but it, I take it that it doesn't end up being a critique of the market, ultimately. Right. 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 I mean, right. so yeah. in other words, yeah. it's right. not. That's I mean, true. so I mean, it's right. not a critique of the right. market. Right. It's not a critique yeah, of the market. Right. Yeah. It, I mean, and yeah. it, it yeah, I, I seems right. to yeah. rest on. I mean, it seems to embrace. It, in, it seems to embrace a, a limited Hayekianism that would actually provide for, and and Hayek himself actually provided for social services and healthcare actually. Universal health care, um, surprisingly, if you read uh, The Road to Serfdom, uh, but limited to uh, the white Europeans, right? So, so I'm not sure, so I mean, that, that, but that leaves me a little bit puzzled as to uh, how it overlaps or so, so, doesn't. So, so one with, of the texts we read here yeah. was The Road from Libertarianism to the Alt-Right, mm -hmm. and that's a non-stop theme. Like, 
you know, as I said in my, my thing, the Alternative for Deutschland emerges out of the Libertarian Party. Mm -hmm. And this is your, and, and this is what Thaynap was saying, that, mm -hmm. that there's this weird connection between Libertarianism and, the all, and, the, and Fascism. And uh, because it's all about winning in a struggle. It's just that the fascist says that certain groups, w you know, have won in the struggle. Mm -hmm. And other groups are just lazy freeloaders, and you force them to work for free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. underlying it, I, and I took this as Zainab's point, mm -hmm. is a market logic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm not saying, I'm uh, sorry. Go ahead. Can I? Go ahead, yeah. Oh, okay. Zainab, go ahead. Oh. Just take a moment of the mic there. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that neoliberalism is exactly fascist. I'm saying, <laughs> I mean, not exactly. Um, well, because they don't go to group. No, well, but, yeah. The yeah, no, uh, fascists are the neoliberal. I mean, no. looking at the texts, oh, they're against the market. This is, this is a discussion I've had uh, also with Wendy Brown. And she was saying, no, because, um, the, uh, you know, the alt-right or whatever, the new right, is against the market, and they they, mm. they would go back to some sort of corporatism if they wanted to, so they're not neoliberal. And I'm, mm. I'm saying, Wendy, read, read your own book, right? I mean, it's, you're right. saying it's the political rationality. Right. It's, we're not talking just about the market. We're talking about a rationality that includes a sort of Darwinism, a justification for... Um, disposing of certain right. portions of the population, um, what happened in New Orleans right. is also part of a, um, a, 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 a blinding oneself to the fact that certain populations are more vulnerable, but then blaming it on them or you turning a blind eye and then rushing in the, the, the contractors, etc., to rebuild New Orleans. So it's part of the same mentality that human beings are no longer human beings for, uh, 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 you know, yeah. for, for being, right. but for doing something right. and, and uh, deserving. Um, right. Yeah, but so I, I, I mean, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I heard what you, I, I heard you as suggesting the continuities, right, which is really important here, mm. yeah. right? In other words, suggesting the continuities, the ways in which... Um, can't talk about fascism without talking about capitalism. Old, <laughs> oh, right, <laughs> old right, comment. Right, 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 <laughs> right. And you can't, and 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 you can't understand, and you can't understand, for instance, you know, the Trump administration, and, and that's you know, that's a point I try to beat in all the time. You can't understand it in, in terms of its logic without going back to the pr previous administration, the one before, in terms of its relationship uh, to. Uh, counterinsurgency and 9/11 and and, but, and and logics of but, but it's warfare. About, it's right. About so the, the Trump thing is about. He always talks about winning. It's about winning. Yeah. Losers have no value, and that's yeah. what Zainab that's was it. saying. Like that's the neoliberalism thing. It's about who who wins, and the market is a way of winning. And right. so that's and you know right. it just moves to groups. That's right. The, right. 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 But it's the it's the it's the deeper it's the deeper continuities in terms of the evisceration of certain institutions, the gutting of certain institutions, the treatment of notions of human capital, etc. That then uh, make the road to uh, the road right. to totalitarianism uh, more e easy, right? I mean that's that's the point. But the point I want to emphasize is that um, uh, it. Depend. It depends in these writings on uh, this ambivalence <coughs> towards the market, which is an ambivalence that is associated with the fact that there's something in this consumerism that they want to that th these authors want to critique. Right there's something about the there's something about neoliberalism that they find problematic, all the while uh, embracing uh, the very same logics. Right, and so there's and uh, and in part this is probably associated with uh, I mean this is probably reflected also in Trump's. Uh, the way in which he is uh, uh, approaching his base, right, to stimulate both a kind of opposition, a kind of reaction against, and at the same time, though, uh, 
to be the most, you know. Uh, <coughs> right, exactly. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Could, but, yeah. Could you pursue that a little more, maybe asking people here, what would it be in the consumerism that drives a wage that contradicts the uh, market uh, way of being? Mm -hmm. Can you continue that a little bit more? Because I'm not convinced that with this uh, logic, uh, it, it strikes me that fascism doesn't rest on logic, and to, it's somewhat in vain to look for a, a logic beneath it or a, underneath it is. Well, there's the lots of contradictions. <laughs> so, what about going back to the contradictions and seeing what happens in the fallout? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, one, one go thing ahead, about the ahead, about the then, sorry, yeah. the, la the last chapter of my book is called Arbeit macht frei. And it's about what white people in America mean when they call black people lazy, which is just what the same as what the Germans meant when they called the Jews lazy. I think the idea is that the global market is like this fiction that Jews try to promote because then they can free ride on the hard work of others. So that's the idea. That banking, so the Germans, the Nazis said the German, you know, banking is a way of of being lazy and just getting money from hardworking people, and and uh, and so Jews free ride on the world free market, and so it so it actually you get this so it's a way of like um, it's a it's a way of using this universal thing to advance their own interests. Uh, so the structure is always Jews use the universal to advance their particular <clears throat> interest. And the universal global market is a way for lazy people, the lazy Jews, to use the, the internationale Finanzjuden, to use the banking system right. to free ride. So that's the particular logic. But we want a system that only rewards hard, genuine hard work. And so a system that only rewards genuine hard work is going to... So... Can I, can I answer here? I think there is some, something here. Uh, which regards the residues of different discourses in this. When he's quoting Alain de Benoit, we're glad to welcome a society with a market but not a market society, I think he's referring to Alain de Benoit's idea that we now construct our identities through the logic of the market. That is, we, we don't have an identity together within culture and coherence, but rather we identify through our con uh, patterns of consumption, for example. So that hits into the identity. Yeah. And the inconsistency here is that Friberg is also into a very different other kind of logic, that is social Darwinism. Yeah. And he tries to combine exactly. these two. Yeah, exactly. And I think that we are on the right track here in trying to discover these inconsistencies. But also remember that it's, it's the, the, the type of thinking that's interesting here, not his actual economic principles, because I'm not sure they're, they're that important even to him. You know, I, I just... Maybe they're so that they need to be there because this is going to be a political manifesto. And he's a businessman, so maybe. But it, I don't think we should take it as like a deep thinker, but it is it's a type of thinking. I think we're on the right track here in trying to figure out what kinds of discourses are at play here. Alain de Benoit has been highly anti-capitalist, and Paul Picon, the former editor of, of Telo, saw him as 95% uh, leftist. For example, uh, be that right or wrong, and, and think what may of it. But these things are at play, and I think that he's just taking it and pushing it out there, printing this book to get it out, to get shit done, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think that, and maybe this goes back to Renata then, I mean, maybe we have to throw the ball back to. Um to psychoanalysis, um, but I mean, it is in these contra these these contradictions are um, are vivid to me uh, on, in the space of two pages. Right, exactly. Basically, in the space of two pages, you've kind of played ping pong uh, between uh, market liberalism and and um, and some notion of a social. Uh, you know, uh, a social state, uh, but then of course a social state that's only limited for the white Europeans, and and I, what it what it what it is, I think, are these kind of appeals to uh, particular uh, emotions, as you were suggesting, which uh, which function well, uh, even if they are uh, internally contradictory, right? So it functions well uh, to to criticize uh, consumerism. It just that 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 functions well in a certain space, because it it's anti-solidaristic, in a way, right? Because it's because it's 
because it's the egoism of of entrepreneurial ship but at the same time it's it functions well to talk about social darwinism right now of course those two are yeah, just right. it's, it's like yeah. you know you couldn't right. get m m more opposite concepts exactly. playing and yet they both are out there they both are deployed and they're deployed i take it because somehow you're yanking at one string with one and at another uh, with the other and the coherence of it isn't at play or isn't important so much as kind of getting <coughs> getting a reaction i don't know uh, yeah. renata what do you think yeah no i i think a number of these texts actually tackle you know the problems of neoliberalism in their own way uh, for example they're speaking about high individualization of today's society. They're speaking about the subject primarily being cons a consumer, even about uh, sports. You know, that's the criticism of sports, that sport is, uh, you know, a, a huge consumer affair, which people are supporting. Um, they are, you know, sort of critiquing uh, the fact that pe people are sort of taking each other, you know, only through their kind of, let's say, market value, you know, and they then they create this fiction of a traditional society where, you know, we will sort of have, again, a kind of homogeneous uh, group. They, I didn't perceive that they are, in a way, idealizing this white man, you know, because they, they're truly using the discourse of losers. And you know, here it is interesting. In some way, this strategy that the one percent, uh, you know, the very rich people are truly, you know, able through this discourse to get this huge support of the losers for them becoming richer. And that's one of the, you know, hmm. main points of Trump's success. You know, that the the losers are fighting uh, for him. And here again, neoliberalism, in in a way succeeded with this idea that winner takes all, you know, <laughs> ideology, which in some way, uh, you know, they are, they are, you know, <laughs> where I see, where I see uh, also another contradiction is in, in there, you know, but it's in some way an interesting one is actually the use of, uh, you know, the, 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 pro the whole problem of kind of uh, truth and facts and so on, they <laughs> really completely deny the need to be factual about whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Shaw speaks about the power of mockery, humor, outrageous statements in which you don't believe, you know, necessarily. You just use them as a tactic. So we, he says that using, you know, kind of outrageous statements about, uh, it, or, or like jokes about gas chambers jokes. Mm -hmm. He says gas chamber mm -hmm. jokes and over top racism can be seen as necessary if painful corrections in some way. But you know, he says that in some way they are, I'm quoting from him, these are devices which serve to break down barriers to honest discourse with humor and to neutralize the ability of cultural commissars to police right wingers with demonstrations of outrage. And then he says, interesting, then he says, there are only so many times that liberals can gasp in horror, gra gravely denounced, and be reduced to tears by racism, anti-Semitism, and so on, before their theatrics produces nothing but eye rolls from the public at large. And then he says, you know, that you have to use crass, blunt arguments and mockery as calculated means of demoralizing laughably prudish and fragile leftists. You know, it's, it's quite, you know, you know, so for him, this is just a tactic. Right. You yeah. know, right. Right. you know, yeah. is yeah. a yeah. tactic. I, I think we're sort of trying to find a, a basic core, basic cause of uh, fascism and uh, uh, it ends up being very abstract and uh, that's not all that helpful. I, uh, are, we, is, are we stuck in the sort of um, exchange value notion of the commodity or something? That's what I'm, I'm thinking. I was very taken by Renata's remark uh, that even if, you, even if you don't agree, you don't oppose. 
And that, to me, shifts uh, the uh, alertness of the analytic mind onto the crowd. And the crowd is a very different thing to talking about the economy, per se. I, and when I think about the crowd, I think um, of theorists of uh, like uh, uh, Pareto or, uh, or Bataille or Benjamin's interest in uh, interest, passion, uh, in the um, uh, play of myth, in the upsurge of the uh, of the right, and the trouble he got into because the liberal intelligentsia or left wing intelligentsia thought that was too dangerous a road to take. Uh, Bataille's uh, notion of uh, unproductive expenditure: people do things for the hell of it. It hasn't got a, it hasn't got an economic it hasn't got a point at economic interest. People prepared to sacrifice themselves all over the world for doing crazy stuff, which we would cross crazy stuff. You, you're not going to contain that by putting it into paradigms of uh, the market or uh, contradictions in the market. That's what I, I fear we've got lost. So I go back to this remark, even if you don't agree, uh, you don't oppose. And that to me is a very frightening uh, reality. I'm wondering how I would react in a particular situation. How many of us here have all been in some sort of situation in which we didn't react? And I would begin analysis from those uh, that sort of incongruity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could, could I try to tie together to, to answer what you said is unanswerable, mm -hmm. just because uh, you said, I don't see how the market is going to connect with the masses and the myth. The masses and the myth are essential here. And I completely agree. Like, you've got to tie together the social Darwinism that Zainab was speaking about with the myth-making and the fictionality that Renata was speaking about. But you have that tied together in the text we've read. Guillaume Fay ties them together. He says, he uses catastrophe to do this, but Hitler does this too with food. Hitler does this with food and population. The idea is we face these catastrophes, and these catastrophes are so extreme that individual struggle is not going to be sufficient. So we need a myth. We need a myth of a nation. And the myth of the nation is going to gather us together so we can fight these catastrophes as a nation. So Guillaume Fay, in the, I quote this in my blog post, is very clear about this. He says, we're going to face environmental disaster, we're going to face economic disaster, and we need to face it as a nation because a lot of people are going to die and we can't care about those people. So we need this myth, so we need all the masses stuff. So I think that's how you tie them together. Uh, who, who are you quoting there? Guillaume uh, Fay. Huh? Guillaume Fay in the oh, reading, oh. the Why We Fight. I was thinking of Bannon for a moment. Right, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, Bannon is very smart. Yeah, yeah no, I Bannon goes back smart. to a, a very considered conservatism. Yeah. Uh, let's open it up a little bit. I know Kendall mm -hmm. wants in here. Uh, let me pass you a mic. And here, why don't you give me one? Sure, Say I'll come in. Um, so, Bernard, I was really quite surprised that you decided to focus <clears throat> on this question of, of the market and passages in the reading on the market in light of your opening remarks, which, if I remember them correctly, foregrounded the question of the alt-right's white supremacist character. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me that that is a reading which is more faithful to the stated commitments of someone like Shaw, who, when he says, I mean, it's, it's, it's right there on the surface. It doesn't even really need to be yeah. interpreted. Um, what we have been witnessing is a result of psychological warfare waged at the level of culture and based in the one topic that white conservatives are not allowed to discuss, race. race. So race provides the overarching meme, um, to use his own preferred term, um, for the situation against which the alt-right is prepared to wage war. I don't think these metaphors of uh, warfare or guerrilla activity are incidental either. This isn't ludic. Um, notwithstanding the references to humor and irony. So um, I do believe, moreover, that the work that race does 
in pulling together these various strands um, <coughs> of the alt-right politic is even more important than the rhetorical gesturing that goes on of this as a battle between a corrupt left and a reinvigorated woke new right. right? So I, I think even the, the framing of the opposition in terms of ideological politics left-right is a distraction from the essential work that conceptions of race are doing. Yeah. But these ideas of race um, emerge uh, and have as their condition of possibility relationships to other social categories. So yes. race is very much gendered, right? So the word race, if you track its usage and um, its cognates in the Shaw introduction, very quickly comes to be a synonym for white manhood. Right? And so whiteness is gendered, um, and race, race, white racial identity exists only, only in and through its gendering as male, or more precisely, um, as masculinist. And it is also quite clearly heterosexualized. Yeah. Right? So you get this litany of all the things. There's one moment where he talks about you know, everything that is wrong with the world, and he lists them, race, and then feminism, yeah. what he denominates as diversity, and then promiscuity, homo, and transsexuality. Right? So we are a world away from the market here in terms of you know, the, the meanings in which um, this alt-right identity lives and, and, and moves um, and, and has its, its being. But it's very much connected to this idea of a dream politics. Right? Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, it's, it's a reversal, a kind of verkettewelt, uh, in which uh, Melly Mel's um, line in the, um, the anthem to Jesse Jackson, when Jesse ran for president, um, the dream is a nightmare in disguise. These, these, these people see what the American dream has become as a nightmare in disguise, and they're offering this alt-dream politics at whose heart is a kind of enjoyment. I think Renata was um, really spot on with that, and also this question of humor, right? Humor and irony, um, which Shaw foregrounds as a kind of wages or the dividends of, of, of alt-right whiteness because the left in cahoots with these black and brown people have engaged in you know what Slavosh calls a theft of enjoyment right and so what they want to enjoy um, and, and, and the enjoyment that they want to, to sort of revive it seems to me with these gas chamber jokes there's a politics at work in that which is the politics of public racial enjoyment so I'm as committed, as you know, as the next person to understanding neoliberalism, particularly racial neoliberalism. But I think um, as a starting point, um, uh, the symbolic economy of this racialization of the world, uh, and, and in that sense, they're, they're mimicking the very thing that they're, they're most opposed to. I mean, they're not original at all, right? Because these deployments of of, of, of misunderstood um, identitarian discourses that they're raging against are, um, you know, their response to a deformed um, and, and, and denigrated um, identity politics that they see the white left um, as harboring and, 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 and giving protection to in the name of multiculturalism, right? Um, and democracy, which is why they hate those things so much. Um, but I, I, I think the place to start really is is with this question of the meanings of of, of race for these for these guys, understood um, as gender and sexual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I I, I I I agree completely. I would say that there are some. 
there are va there are variations. I mean, so I was focusing there on uh, Freiburg, and there are the the there are variations in the way in which this is presented. And the and the American text uh, has race right in the first word, right? I mean, race its own line, mm -hmm. right? And um, and I was just picking up on the on the neoliberalism question. The next passage we were going to look at was this passage on racism in Shaw, right. which uh, Jason was going to. But um, but I think it's it is Im it is important though to note the variations in the in the languages with the Swedish uh, New Right, for instance, mm -hmm. and the way I mean, and so uh, uh, and so the way in which. Uh, race there is ethnicized, and it's it's really about non-Europeans, uh, Muslims. Um, um, although, uh, although uh, all, along all the same lines, right. so you know, homosexuals, right. homosexuals, right. Muslims, well, Jews, gender ideology, others, right? clear yeah. clear yeah. gender as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 totally. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Jim wants in quickly, and then maybe we could come back to this passage, which we were going to go to. Can I say one thing? Okay, very, very, very quickly. Yeah. Very, something very quickly. So, 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 I think of it in terms of, like, I completely agree Here. with you. You've got to, like, completely front race. I, uh, but the connection, I think, uh, and start with race, but, the, uh, but I think of it in terms of racial capitalism and how Du Bois Absolutely. is thinking of it in, in Black Reconstruction right. as, like, the outgroup is lazy. And that's something you find everywhere. And that's why you make them work for free. And so it starts with race, because then you get a group that has less values. But. Yeah, I based my comments on having reported on these movements after Oklahoma for a year, and having spent time talking to their leadership. So the idea of an international was there at the time. The neo-Nazi elements of this worked as an international at that time. Uh, and it was a fact, because, yeah. and, and they took advantage of the fact that publishing in this country before the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union, we had publishing houses that were dedicated to support internationally neo-Nazi thought. So the problem I'm having a little bit with this discussion is that this is sort of neo-Nazism and fascism light, you know, mm -hmm. because behind it, these leaders of have absorbed Alfred Rosenberg, uh, Jose Antonio de Primavera, they've absorbed the classic Nazi right. and fascist writings. Exactly. Yeah. They're trying to figure out how to do it vanilla style. Exactly. So the question I have to the panel is, let's say you didn't read the Turner Diaries, which was their triggering work. Right. And let's look at what they're doing in their practice. How does the panel look at how they're going to Berkeley? They want to do this annually. To take the free speech movement and turn it on its head, yeah. mm -hmm. and secondly, the question of, uh, you know, where do we see the distinctions between the spectacles of Trump? I mean, is this the equivalent of triumph of the will? A uh, new way to look at it? I'm just curious what you all think. Uh, so, so this is, I, I've been lecture talking about the connection between the free speech movement and the free speech movement and the far right for three years now and debating. You're absolutely right. Everything you said is I've been out there. I've seen what they did. Yeah, no, right. I, I, but also, there's the whitewashed movement of that's sort of saying, you know, oh, free speech on campus, race, like the, the trope. So Carl did something very interesting. Carl said, you might read these two pages as crazy. And that was very jarring to me because the two pages he read, I don't at all read as crazy because the idea that race, to call something racist is anti-free speech is mainstream right now mm -hmm. in the United States. And so that, so this is your vanilla point about how uh, this, so, so for instance, uh, there were two pages here. Right. The first, the first page. So this, he, is the dis so this is Shaw's discussion at 188 of right. races. So this is stuff that Carl read. At, this is how far advanced. Carl read this as crazy. Um, ideas as presupposed. Racism is an ex expressive vocabulary. And he says, we uh, take the foremost example of our age, racism. We say the word not as a thing that objectively exists, but as a sin that we oppose because we are good. Here's John McWhorter, who's a Columbia professor. The anti-racism religion, then, has cl clergy, creed, and even a conception of original sin. So this is at the very forefront of organizations like FIRE, Heterodox Academy. I debated Heterodox Academy over the summer. Um, 
this, the second page that Carl read is crazy about racism. Racism is illogical because racism is, is simply recognition of reality. What's the function of Charles Murray? Why is Charles Murray giving a million talks for $10,000, $20,000 a pop? Because he's the one who you can't say is Milo. He's the one who you have to be like, oh, he's rational. He's a real academic. And what he's saying is, oh, let's just look at the facts. Racism is rational. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are now. There's, there's, you know, the role of Charles Murray to say, oh, he's not like the Berkeley free speech crazies. He's the rational one coming, giving logical arguments. And that's why Charles Murray has given like two talks at Yale in the last two years and talks at Stanford and every, because, so these two pages don't read for Americans in academia as crazy at all. They read as mainstream. Well, that's, that, that's interesting. Oh. Thank you. I, I don't think I call them crazy. Oh, uh, well, well I, I, you said our reaction might be that they are crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, but I was getting to the point that he's inconsistent in his idea of what a new speak term is. Ah. Uh, but, but, I mean, not with that notwithstanding, I, I agree with you. Does, is, it, is it common for presidential rallies in the United States to take place in hangars? It is now. <laughs> yeah, re regarding the triumph of the will, you know, Trump landing from an airplane from above, oh, wow. stepping out, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and that, that's the triumph of the will as well. I mean, Hitler starts in the air, right? right. But, I mean, enough with those analogies. Regarding this lineage, I think that's also uh, interesting and important, because in the blog post, for example, I was talking about the new right as something that started in 68. I mean, that is a truth without modification. Um, whereas, <coughs> actually, the inspiration for the new right came from the conservative revolution, you know, in the interwar years. And that, that actually was sparked by Armin Moller right after the war, writing a handbook for, more or less, for surviving afterwards in the Interregnum, uh, creating the myth around the conservative revolution. And you also had the founding of the Europäische Soziale Bewegung and the National Europa Journal, where Armin Moller has written, where Julius Evola has written, where Jean-Marie Le Pen has written, and where Alain de Benoit has written, the former of, of uh, European New Right. So there is a, not only a continuity ideologically with neoliberalism, but also a continuity way back with radical rights or nationalist socialist thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. All right, I've got, I've got three uh, questions starting with Camilla. So uh, first of all, I want to um, well, thank the panel, but uh, problematize with uh, the language that you're using, uh, because in a way we're talking about the alt right, and uh, this is a new vocabulary that is um, based on self identification. And actually, as an ex journalist, I'm always looking at about how we um, what, what concepts we used, and um, I would say the press and other uh, news outlets have actually argued against using outright because you're sanitizing uh, fascism in a way, or fascist tendencies, basically. And, <clears throat> and it's not negative. Alt is something that is just alternative. Mm -hmm. And this is not something, it's something that we are abstracting uh, the substance out of it. Uh, and we are just putting it in the normal spectrum. So, um, and therefore, uh, totalitarianism is in the same spectrum as liberal democracy. It's just you know, fluid, in a way, instead of being a kind of different regime type. Uh, that it is it could be um, founded if in this ideology, and it's not systemic, so it is a very different different um, um, phenomena. So then, uh, the, 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 this relation between neoliberalism and fascism, uh, we are looking back to Hitler, but I think we need to go back to Pinochet and not Hitler, because in a way, the relation between uh, this um, supremacy ideology and neoliberalism was um, born there in a way, and with Patrick in a certain another way. Uh, but um, it is very different from the 1930s and 40s, and I would say that this is very uh, kind of like forces us to understand the relationship between oligarchy, because neoliberalism is the ideology of oligarchy, of the supremacy of the few wealthy in, in a way, um, uh, how that is, has kind of co-opted fascism or used fascism or fascistic fear in a way, all this uh, how, and there's a lot of uh, um, being written about how images are being used in Eastern Europe and other places where they have 0.6% of the population are refugees and they are 70% against refugees because they're being flooded, right? So the, how this is created and how they're learning from other, fa from previous fascism, but they're being used. 
and therefore you don't have equality for the natives anymore because you have neoliberalism and neoliberalism doesn't go with social services. This is a limit because this is where oligarchy starts a, uh, being undermined. So there is a kind of a tension there that cannot be resolved in a way or you know, there's a limit. And then the place of free speech is we need to think about legality too, because in the US is the safe haven of all the websites of this alternative right that is being prohibited all over Europe. Here, you can say whatever. So there is kind of like uh, the idea of this absolute freedom of speech that everything goes. At the end, it allows for uh, supremacy to be spread and how uh, neutrality, this side and the other side are correct in a way, it's a way of promoting this kind of uh, ideology. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'll come right back to, to, the, to your two points after we get some more points. I just want to say I never used the term all right. <laughs> well, that was the whole point. That was the whole point of the of your of your intervention was to not use the point all right. Oh wait, je comprends mais Something that has worried me for a long time. This was slightly hinted at by Professor Gambetti is the possibility of the fact that the alt-right uses and takes advantage of a lot of the intellectual labor of the left. Uh, take, take, for example, somebody like Michel Foucault and his regimes of truth. I think that there's a very strong correlation between those that type of relativism and what, what a lot of the things that we find today, like people not, still not believing in climate change, things like alternative facts, facts etc. And I can only ask myself, I mean, why do circles like this just continue to view Foucault in what I find to be a very, perhaps a one-dimensional way? Why don't we try to see the ways that he's actually been hurting, you know, to be a little bit provocative, our society, our democracy? And um, yes, that's, uh, is, is, what, how has he hurt, you know, our conception of truth? And uh, yeah. Okay, and Jeff, and then I'll get to you. Yeah, so um, so my question, I, I think, is um, about tying together some of the observations about the modern speech environment. And I think there, there are sort of a couple of parts of that. Part of it, um, I think Camilla and also Professor Stanley talking about sort of the ideological drift of the concept of free speech. Um, so, you know, free speech as an idea in America was once sort of the progressive um, uh, dream, but now has you know com been completely uh, usurped by by the right, such that you know fr free speech and all right sort of are uh, go hand in hand now. And then the other part of that um, is what um, the the phrase of um, the imperative is that everybody needs to find a way to be heard. And that, I think, is, um, relates to uh, the social media environment and technology platforms and just the mode of communication right now. So I think that there are sort of these two parts of um, just how communication is disseminated and also the political valence of just the idea of speech. Um, and so I'm curious about how that relates to Professor Gambetti's idea of an affirmative project of developing cultures, you know, uh, what, how does uh, an egalitarian vision emerge out of this um, this modern speech environment where uh, the political valence of free speech is so far to the right, and um, you know the the modes of communication are not uh, hospitable to ideas like communicative action or sincerity or you know any of the types of communication or action that might lead to egalitarian culture development. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh, bring it down over here. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to say this in abstract but now that Pinochet was brought into the table, maybe, and <laughs> and um, Chilean. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I think that it's a good starting point for what I wanted to say. Um, I think that actually Pinochet is a, a, an incorrect example of what we are talking, 
Uh, because I think what this movement has in common, and uh, I was expected to hear that from the panel, it's precisely their democratic vocation in a very weak sense of democracy, of course. In the contrary sense of uh, a deliberative uh, democracy. Uh, what these movements are trying to do is to persuade and that's why we're talking about psychoanalysis. If we were speaking about, a di about uh, dictatorships, then we would be speaking about armies, not about uh, Freud, not about Lacan. What these movements have in common, I think, it's an uh, attempt to persuade people that are, of course, not Russian. But nobody here is Russian. We become rational through uh, a process, a conscient process. But one tends to, I think, to pursue contradictory purposes. One would, li one would like a meaningful uh, love companion, but would like probably to have a million of sex partners in, in, in her or his life. One wants to rest, but at the same time, one wants to do a lot of things. So I think those contradictions uh, that we can find in this text are deliberate because they are appealing, they are, they are trying to conquer the unconscious of people who don't want to assume themselves as losers, as, if, uh, as, as uh, it has been said in this panel, uh, people that uh, are full of contradictions and they want to win their vote. Uh, so. Of course, it's clear to me that they should be very contradictory in order to be persuasive because they're speaking to a specific target. So that's my um, OK, so uh, let's do this. Let's have a, a quick round of uh, responses from, from the panel, and then we'll come back out for some questions, I, I, uh, in part because I wanted to say three things. <laughs> <laughs> Only three. <laughs> Only three. Yeah, um, so, um, so, so, Camilla, I, I agree completely. That's kind, of, that's kind of like where we started, which is, you know, do you use the language of alt-right or not? Um, but the question does become, you know, so what's the right term? Okay, I mean, so I mean, we have one on the, on the table, fascism for sure. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it it would be useful to have a term that identifies this moment. I I feel that's my that's my hesitation. In other words, uh, useful to have a term that I that that captures some of the singular some some of the difference of what what's going on right now uh, and not just and not just the similarities and and um, okay if uh, we're talking about the tactics not the structure it's hard to see that race you know these are old tactics these are fascist tactics Du Bois in black reconstruction uses the term fascism yeah but yeah but it's I mean but it's the same thing I mean so it's the same thing with kind of like neoliberalism versus liberalism right I mean there's there's something valuable in identifying I mean you can look at neoliberalism and you can trace so much back to but this is fair but it, but there's the something point. there's some advantage okay that's one thing we're gonna and it Jim's gonna jump in on that in a second but Okay. Sorry, yeah, it's not my turn. But because of the question you, you, you are asking, something surprises me. The term populism never came up. Thank Normally, you. I am against the use of that category right. because I believe that it's full of confusions. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, particularly, it has the enormous uh, inconvenient in many political situations that we know to apparently establish a kind of uh, reciprocity or equivalence between left and right, okay. where I still believe that this, a distinction should be made. This being said, the kind of internal contradictions that not only are not detrimental to the progress of the uh, uh, movements we are describing, but are in fact used by them, perhaps consciously, and in any case practically, very effectively, uh, for a number of, of, of reasons, precisely 
could lead to uh, asking why you don't simply use populist. Uh, of course, not as a mild uh, category, uh, and uh, we all know that there's a long story of uh, different uses of populism and, uh, and that covers it. But at this moment, seen from Europe in particular, uh, where I uh, uh, increasingly believe that the so-called brown, uh, uh, red, alliance or tendentious, uh, okay. tendential uh, uh, alliance which is not the same as in the 30s, but has nevertheless very many simil similarities at the level of discourse, right. is, a, is an absolutely central problem and danger for, say, democracy, etc. When you read Zara Wagenknecht or Mélenchon on one side, and, uh, and Le Pen and the others are on the, on the other side, they, they, they have increasing, they, they're still different. I'm not saying they are uh, already uh, uh, merging, so to speak. Uh, perhaps they never merge. But they have increasing an increasing amount of uh, uh, um, uh, words, as uh, uh, Jason was uh, uh, explaining. In, 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 in common, and that is a terrible contribution to the progressive invasion of uh, uh, our political language by uh, this, uh, this new, uh, sorry, I should. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, Okay, very quickly, I'm going to reduce it to two things. The other thing, uh, just on the Pinochet point, and on the Pinochet point, um, uh, um, you know, I, the, and, and, I, and I preface that, I put that right up at the top of the, the reading notes, in part because I was at this conference for two days on, on, on transnational uh, counter-revolutions, which was all about Latin America and the Latin American right. And, and someone had flashed up this picture of um, these uh, guys, uh, uh, white supremacists, or, or, or alt-right, whatever you want to call it, yeah. Yeah, who are, were, it looked like it was in California, and on the front of their T-shirt, and I, I, I actually stole the picture from uh, Margaret Powers. On the front of it, it says, you know, Pinochet did no wrong, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Pinochet did no wrong. On the back of the shirts were um, Antifa removal, yeah. right? And I was just trying to puzzle with a helicopter, then, with a helicopter right? <laughs> and of course, so then, and so uh, that was the passage that I they love uh, put at the beginning of uh, of the post, which yeah. is. In this, in in our fair hearing, uh, page two ten to eleven, right uh, about physical removal, right, which is so it embraces physical yeah. removal, and it writes uh, the meme of physical removal um, of removing leftists has gained a, a lot of traction because the idea is instinctively both logical and appealing. The means of physical removal uh, of leftists, however, is not simple. While throwing commies from helicopters a la Pinochet has been the alt-right's favorite policy proposals, this is clearly an inefficient solution. <laughs> okay, uh, The Pinochet regime only executed 120 communists in this manner, and we are faced with many thousands of times this number. And then it goes on into this long discussion of... Uh, of the Japanese internment camps uh, in World War II as being a much better model, right? But I mean, so, but I mean, so there is, I mean, yeah, there is, in fact, I mean, it's playing on so, it plays on so many different registers, but one register on which it is playing, in here at least, is an appeal to this notion of, of, uh, of authoritarianism uh, through uh, Pinochet as not having been, in some sense, efficient enough. Um, Okay, and I'll, uh, well, yeah, okay, no, all right. Um, uh, I, well, you know, just the one thing about back to individual, the, the question of, 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 um, of uh, Darwinism and, and race, and, and it, you yeah, know, Darwin the one had co nothing to say about race. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, the, the coherent way in which to read all of this the is 90s. that it's a, it's a collective social Darwinism. Right, exactly. Right, and that's the point. It's not an individualistic right. social Darwinism. Yeah. It's not where um, yeah. any particular individual from any group could actually uh, win. Right? It's it's the group. It's the white and the nineteenth century genesis the, in the United States of fact Hitler. So the, we have a, this. The history is all laid out. We a fact the Nazis with the eugenics social Darwinism mm -hmm. of groups. Right. You know, right. So. Right. Uh, but 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 a group social Darwinism 
makes much more sense of the, the uh, creates some forms of coherence that then don't create the problem. Yeah, that's what Darwin That's not neoliberalism. Right. Yeah. That's not neoliberalism. No, well, we're right. No. Neoliberalism moves from, is sits at the individual level, and fascism takes that thinking and moves it to the group level. Yeah. And um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I'll just be. I'll just only address the point about free speech. So I guess there's two two things. So my book, How Propaganda Works, begins with a quote from Goebbels, where he says, "The greatest joke of democracy will be that its freedoms were used." By its enemies' greatest victor, to, to by its enemies to defeat it. Um, the whole my book, How Propaganda Works, is about the contradiction between free speech and democracy, which goes back to Book Eight of Plato's Republic. This is this the question you asked, and the point. I mean, this is political philosophy. Like most of political, like Rousseau in the Social Contract says. Um, People scoff at the system I talk of because they say, oh, a magician with words from Paris or London could just bewitch the masses. He says, but they've never thought of a, of a well-structured society, by which he means one where there's very little or more papa, and people have gone through whatever Emile's education was, but hopefully not Sophie's. Um, and uh, so, so this problem that we're facing of free speech, I mean, Julius Streicher was a free speech martyr. He was accused of the, the right-wing tactic of doing free speech martyrs that we're now seeing. This is old. <laughs> this is how, like, Tommy Robinson, what, what Bannon's doing with Tommy Robinson in the UK, this is just what you do. We're not, do you want okay, to jump yeah. in? Um, yeah, I really liked the, the uh, Chilean um, uh, questions. Since I spent this summer one month there, um, my uh, idea was to analyze how neoliberalism actually there, you know, in some way very much succeeded because people truly internalized it. So I met with psychoanalysts to speak about this, how, you know, and it's yeah. unbelievable that the, the, the most poor people would absolutely blame themselves mm -hmm. and still believe that they have a choice, although they have no time for anything but work, because you have the longest hours there. When I was there, the most, you know, shocking fight emerged around the Museum of Human Rights, because one of the politicians claimed that it's a complete fiction. This museum, which presents torture, you know, which presents what Pinochet was doing, and you know, there was this discussion. It was a complete relativization of human rights, of suffering, and you know, one of the idea in this battle was also that dictatorship that happens happened was inevitable, and that inevitable because otherwise something even more horrible would happen. And, you know, I happily visited also Eastern Islands, where Pinochet is called the general and very much loved. Why? Because he understood their pain. He visited them a couple of times and, you know, was compassionate to them. It's very sunny there. <laughs> Yes, there's um, a lot to say also, but I would like to um, perhaps start with the, the Chile example because um, after Chile came the Turkish coup. And it was a neoliberal coup. I mean, it wasn't, it's not just the economy or an exchange value. It's not going back to Marxism as, you know, describing fascism as a fix to capitalism's contradictions. That's not what I what I think we are saying here. We are saying here that there was a certain level of violence, state violence and dictatorships also, um, that we had to suffer in order for the economy to be free. Now, um, in the Turkish coup in 1980 was also done by our boys, right, the Chicago boys. And the, the, the Turkish coup did enable the implementation of the, the sort of decision taken by um, the, the government, um, the civilian government before the coup, um, to open up the economy to the market. So, but, but what I think we shouldn't be doing is thinking neoliberalism is an economic thing. It's not economic. Neoliberalism has to do with the redefinition of freedom. Neoliberalism has to do with the redefinition of rights, redefinition of um, worth, human worth, right? And, and it's a societal relationship. It's, a, it's like, I mean, it, it, 
I don't want to use the, the word culture, but, but it brings back sacrifice, um, uh, you know, what, what's it called? The austerity um, measures, the sort of um, the, the normalization of all this into the picture, of inequalities into the picture. So my question would be, why the re-racialization? Um, of 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 uh, population societies and politics. Uh, now, my answer would be liberalism, right? So I think I think it's it's that. I mean, why this forceful comeback? Yeah. Um, and so that's one thing. And I think I think Pinochet was neoliberal in that respect because it, he was he was implicated in that game. And today they're going to do a vanilla way. They're not going to do it the cool way. I mean, in, in Turkey, they're still trying to do it the cool way, right? I mean, let's not forget the coup as a neoliberal tactic. But, but they, they will do it the vanilla way, and they don't have to you know, throw the, the, the commies out of the helicopter. There are much more efficient ways and much more sort of like, you know, acceptable ways to do that, right? So, um, so I think that was what I was trying to say. I hope it didn't sound like, oh, it's only the economy. Um, but yeah, one thing about logic, I think contradiction can be logical. That's my also um, very um, Arantian take on it. I tend to defend me here. Um, for Arant, totalitarianism, um, sort of the totalitarian um, ideology, as she calls it, is, consists of um, saying or decreting A, and then going to the end of the alphabet, deriving uh, or deducing from that. So it's, it's all about syllogisms. It's all about the axiomatic whites are being are under attack, let's say. And then you deduce the whole set of doctrines from or, um, uh, or uh, axioms from that. And therefore, when I read Shaw, I didn't write it, I, I had to cut it because I, I was in delirium myself reading Shaw. I mean, I think you should, you should read his rendition of Orwell. It's like Orwell inverted, the inversion of an inversion. It's, it's like he leaves us no ground. Uh, it's horrible, I think. But I think what he's doing is there is an axiom from which he deduces the rest. Punto. And... Arendt would say that's what makes it ideological, and that's what, what makes it totalitarian. <laughs> I've also actually been, been thinking Sorry, about, about Arendt. That uh, like a, Sorry. But yeah. on another level, regarding the question of what to call them, the alt right or call them fascists, I, I, I sympathize with the question and uh, with the tendency to want to not whitewash these tendencies. And when I was thinking about R, and I was actually thinking about love and mostly forgiveness as a, as a practice, in a way. You know, Arendt has, she says, first of all, that, yeah, it might sound religious, but just because it was articulated in a religious context by Jesus of Nazareth doesn't mean that it's less important. And her idea about forgiveness, the way I understand it, is that in a plurality, we, we constantly do things that mess up our different projects. And our way to continue forward is to not hold each other into that. You know, that's why we have the forgiveness and that's why we have the promise. Why am I speaking on this? Well, because if it was clear that the alt right is this, then, then I wouldn't have a problem with it. But, you know, the alt right as an online phenomenon emerged when it was very unclear what was alt right and what was not. And especially if you look at the development of uh, the anonymous movement, for example, that started as an online transgression that people did. People did messed up stuff online right. in a transgressive atmosphere. Mm -hmm. yeah. Throughout the years, Anonymous was heavily politicized and moralized, so they were supposed to do good stuff. And there were a lot of internal contradictions with within that transgressive environment, because there were people who simply wanted to be free from ideology or whatever. And we can, we can critique that, but I believe that there are a lot of these people that actually, actually also got sucked up in the alt-right movement with the transgressive Nazi posting and whatsoever, who wanted to just rage against every um, effing thing. Uh, and so, so the question is, who are we calling uh, the alt-right or calling fascists? And why this is important? I don't know if this is important in America, but 
Let me give you an example from Sweden. So, 10 years ago, I was work, working in a social youth organization, and one of my colleagues there, he was a former Nazi, and he, he worked with helping young people to get out of Nazi movements. So, and when he tells the story about, let's call him Ronnie, about how he ended up leaving the movement, it was because he met a Muslim guy who arranged a debate on racism with him. And everybody hated this Muslim guy for doing so, because you can't debate with Nazis, fair enough. But after that debate, this guy went up to Ronnie and said, Hey, do you see what you've done? You've organized all the Nazis in Eskilstuna, which is a very small city, but, but they were violent and brutal. But with Romney, they were actually organized. And this guy said, you show a lot of potential. Do you know that you can do something good with this? And that became his exit. Okay? In 1999, the four biggest Swedish media houses in Sweden gathered their uh, resources to report on the men of hate and hostility in Sweden. And they published mm -hmm. with name and picture in the newspapers 62 terrorists, threats against democracy. These are the people who are a threat to you and your family. All right? And there were terrorists there, there were murderers there, there were bicycle gangs there. And there was also a picture of 21-year-old 20, Daniel Friberg. All right? And he's been writing about this afterwards, how much that actually pushed him into this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if somebody who had said to him, instead of publishing his name, said that, hey man, you're on the wrong track, but you show a lot of potential, imagine that you can actually do something good with this. We might not have this effing publishing house spreading this kind of stuff. Another person on this list was a 25-year-old Matthias Carlson. He is now the chief ideologist of the Sweden Democrats. To this day, effing up the politics in my country. Okay, they are around 20%, and we don't know how to form a government because of this, because we want to keep them out. I'm not saying that this is what we always should be doing, but think about that. There are actual people here, and the question of a polity is not if we're asking the whole polity. It's not about asking what do we do about them, but what are we going to do about us? And I want to keep that space open. Hence my precautions about using fascist, Nazi, even though my heart tells me that I should be doing that. So. Okay, thanks Carl. So usually at this point we, we, uh, we, we come back with final uh, statements by the panel, but, um, but instead I think we're going to have final comments by uh, two brilliant uh, students and a uh, brilliant uh, visiting scholar, Dana. So we're going to start with you, Diana. So we'll do Diana, Teresa, and then Dana. Uh, so you get the last, last word, so no questions, <laughs> turn your questions into comments. Oh, no, it's hard, because unfortunately I really had questions this time. Uh, almost not comments, but questions. Questions that comes from the Human Rights Advocate Place, which is the one that I'm always called to, to talk from uh, in this place. Uh, and uh, as a Human Rights Advocate that reads the left, I do feel cornered. Um, and I, 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 uh, I would really love to keep the conversation ongoing on the ways of getting out of the corner. Um, and the reason why I feel there has been like a really useful way of being cornered, like w the effect of, of how this happens, is on one hand that if we call them all right, or if we use any sort of concepts that they create, uh, we are uh, sort of giving up on the s semantic world that they, uh, they want us to believe. We open up the framework to what they want us to say. But on the other side, if I keep calling them fascist and uh, um, um, nazist, and, uh, it has um, this uh, ironic effect that they're talking about when they're talking about humor. On, on the one side, it brings a lot of polarization, which automatically seems to be leaving us without reach for the possible audiences that might be reading this, the possible people that might be actually influenced. We have not talked here about the audiences of these books and how, they, how, how we might reach them or not. Um, uh, and, and it seems like polarization uh, and quick uh, signaling uh, as, as they say, will end up in us, the left, crying and people uh, turning their eyes over and being tired of, oh, here you go again, everything is nazis, everything is fascist. So whatever, yeah, we're just going to be fascist because everything is right. So it's, there's also a way of like 
not not working politically, not working for any strategy of resistance uh, that are that I will call up upon you. Uh, <laughs> Stand or redemption. Or redemption. Or redemption. Yeah. And then the other, the other. Um, and what if we use new terms? And in the use of new terms, which I, I believe there will be a really interesting value of doing that. Seems like a way of getting out of being corner. We also are facing all the problems and effectiveness of creating new language. Uh, and and in this point, I will talk about, uh, for example, the concept of gender ideology in Latin America that has been so useful to um, uh, invalidate feminism or gender studies or the, the women's movement and women's rights. Uh, if, if you use the term gender ideology, it seems like it actually existed. Uh, if you use uh, gender studies or feminism, it is just like what has been there forever. If you use new terms, you kind of lose all the institutional power that you have already gained. Uh, just uh, to end that, I have a, a, another question I'm really worrying about, and it's about the difference between the global rights, uh, not just their similarities. Uh, and this has become, I come from the global south, I come from uh, South America, and I believe Bolsonaro is not the same thing as, as Trump. Uh, he comes is strengthened by the military, for example, and they, they are even not, even though the project would always be racial, as they put it in both sides, for example, in Latin America, it seems to be all uh, gathering around gender or other sort of, there, there is a reshaping of the rights language. So how global um, South elites take this rise of the right to accommodate it to their own is also <coughs> make me wondering, especially when we're talking about people's lives, which is what I'm more urgent and nightmare thinking Thank about. Thank you, Diana. Yeah. Teresa. Okay, uh, I've written on the question because otherwise it's going to take long and I'm not going to be very specific. So I do agree that um, it was said here around the relationship between neoliberalism and all right, that the center of the discourse is a meta-material proposal based on engendered wildness. But I do think there is a perverse relationship to neoliberalism that also deserves to be thought. Because even if in terms of polity practice, these movement, movements are openly in favor of free market and with Reddit, and we can see it in their political agendas when they consider political parties. And of course, even if their critique to globalization is actually a claim for a reinforcement of national capitalism, that we've seen it here as well, some of these discourses, discourses do actually carry a critique to globalization and a claim for reinforcement of the power of the politic over the economic, and there is my point, the reinforcement of sovereign powers and state power. France, but especially Brexit, are examples of this. And what I wonder here is if there might be a relationship that interests us between the state phobia in the left radical movement, I mean, the rejection to locate the anti-capitalist debate in a state versus market frame, and how appealing these anti-globalization discourses, or strategic, strategically anti-globalization discourses, can be to white working class citizens that lack every kind of state protection. And of course, I'm not denying that there is a fundamental, and especially uh, it's about this, racist, xenophobic, trans-homophobic, and patriarchal social Darwinism beyond this. But I think there is also a state element in the discursive strategy of right populism that should concern the crisis in the left. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on, we got one more. We got one more. Movement um, can has risen, and especially when we think about it in a 
chronological way, as an explanation of why this has come now, I find it important to also see how neoliberalism or social Darwinism has never been free, wherever it actually existed as an impact on society, these societies have never been free of racism and these fascist threats. So just that I feel when fighting against people who are fighting against equality, we should not forget that there's never been an equal world, but mm -hmm. we are always starting from preconditions of high inequality. The second thing in relation to this um, gradual scale between uh, social Darwinism or neoliberalism and fascism is to think how much do we view this in terms of actors and how much do we view it in terms of structure. And when we speak about neoliberalism, we have in mind very much a structure thing, whereas these texts bring us to think of actors. And throughout reading this, to me, what's been prevalent is this switching between thinking of the people we consider as them as perpetrators or as victims, or a little bit as foes. And these descriptions where of how, how could this arise, which also reminds me of Sigmund Baumann's Strangers and Our Doers, they tend to paint people a little bit in, as victims of these structures who fall for these fascist explanations. And then in the last part, I, I, I try to think of where I, I think we should not take away a sort of responsibility in embracing these ideologies. And when the very beginning of the Freiburg book, they speak about the defense of values, which I think is the ground language in Europe that defends as values. And the defense of the nuclear family. I find this so interesting, nuclear family, because it says we're not pro family. Let these immigrant families who come in to like from the nuclear family. As the European man, and to me it's nothing but a code for extreme selfishness. <laughs> so where the closest one can get to, I'm not willing to share. Um, so yeah, to me, important in thinking about this in terms of actors and structure is not to lose sight of the responsibility to, of each individual, um, whether it's impact or not. Thank you, yeah. Dana. So um, yeah, so we've run out of time. <laughs> Thank you to our extraordinary panelists and our extraordinary guests and, uh, and all, of, all of you. Uh, the blog is open for more comments, so uh, maybe we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Clearly, this is a conversation that needs to continue. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah.